So we were on this slide last time, software defined radio, and I'm going to do it again. So basically most of the radio is analog, right? And that's a problem because um, analog means they are very specific to a frequency, modulation, everything is fixed, sort of fixed. And so nowadays we need to be able to change everything on demand and that's why it's better just we just make the signal digital as soon as possible, as soon as it comes into the system and that means convert from A to D. Once it is digital, then we can use high powered computers and, um, and then process it any way we want, right? So generally we use digital signal processors or FPGAs. FPGAs are field programmable arrays which are basically you can just program them in hardware to do any algorithm you want, right? So they're very fast for special purposes. So, so the signal is digitized as soon as it comes and um, then this is A to D is an analog to digital converter and then the D goes into the FPGA um, and then you can change the software by any method. This is very flexible, very upgradable, very low, well, I wouldn't say low cost, but it is because it is digital uh, and now much of this is becoming standard, it has become really low cost and low power consumption. All right. And to the extent that only if this part was left to be analog, which is the A to D converter, and there is something behind and in front of it, and then the antenna. But now people are even talking about software defined antenna, where they will print a very small pixels on a chip, which can be connected to be for any desired frequency band that you want. So everything is becoming digital. Most of it is becoming digital. So this is called software defined radio. Now you should not, you should not confuse software defined radio with software defined networks. SDN, all right? SDN is a totally different concept, which is, which actually, um, I don't know whether we'll get into this course or not, but SDN is for general networks, nothing to do with wireless. And SDR has been around for a long time. SDN is just, you know, three to five years old. SDR is much older than that. So, software defined radio and software defined networks, actually in some sense they might be similar, but nowadays we can define the whole network by software and that is SDN. What that means is in SDN you can program a whole data center sitting on one chair and hundreds of routers and virtual machines are created and, you know, connected any way you want. So that is SDN. Here SDR has to do with the radio. All right. And this concept has been around for some time. Any question about SDR? The next concept that came in is cognitive radio. So software defined and cognitive. Cognitive means smart, right? I mean, cognitive means something that can recognize, something that can sense. So it's more than just software defined. Software defined can follow your orders, but really cannot think. Whereas cognitive can basically think, you know, sense. Cognitive means percept, perceive, a sense. <clears throat> so cognitive radio is the one that can sense the radio environment, select the proper frequency, bandwidth, power, modulation, and avoid the interference. So it's basically a smart radio. It will see what frequencies are being used and then it will decide what frequency to use and reconfigure, what modulation is good and things like that. So that basically extra logic around SDR makes it a cognitive radio. Okay. And this is a continuous process. So it continuously senses and continuously reconfigures itself. And um, so this basically idea came in that we can use the spectrum even if it is licensed by somebody if um, if they are not using it. Why waste it? A spectrum is such a, an expensive useful resource that if somebody licensed it and didn't use it, we can use it. And so somebody came up with the idea and told it to FCC and FCC allowed it. All right. So they said, okay, if you are not 
you know, bothering with the military bands and things like that, you know, you go ahead and we can let you do. So there are certain frequencies that they opened up, licensed frequencies that they opened up for general use. Now, before we go into that more detail, first we should understand the effect of frequencies. And this is a very general, next, next two slides are very important and very general concepts in wireless. First is, we have already heard many times, higher frequencies have higher attenuation, right? F square, we saw that. As you go higher frequency, higher attenuation means they cannot go that far. Right? Every kilometer they have la larger F square, you know, 60 gigahertz versus 2 gigahertz, 30 times. You have 900 times the attenuation, so you cannot go, you know, that much. And um, higher frequencies have a smaller, need a smaller antenna, because antenna and the spacing and the size is all related to wavelength. The higher frequencies have a smaller wavelength, and therefore, that's good. I mean, basically, we don't want to carry big antennas like we used to carry with the radio, remember? So, so that's good. First thing was bad, second thing is good. Third thing is, they are affected more by the weather. All right, so that's not good because if it starts raining or something, you know, it's not, it doesn't go that far. In particular, some frequencies. So people have a base, you know, basically what is the effect of, you know, rain and all that on different frequencies. And so there are some peaks and valleys in that spectrum. Higher frequencies have more bandwidth than higher data rates. So good thing is that at 60 gigahertz, you can easily find, you know, 2 gigahertz. You cannot find 2 gigahertz at, you know, 500 megahertz. So, so the idea is that higher frequencies are good because you can get large sub spectrum. Higher frequency allow more frequency reuse. Now, since they don't go too far, and actually also they go more in a straight line, you can reuse them, you know, right there, very close to each other. As opposed to things that go everywhere, you can't reuse them very easily because they will interfere. So that's another thing. In multi, basically you can use reuse. So just the opposite of that, lower frequencies have longer reach. All right. Lower frequencies require larger antennas and antenna spacing. spacing. So if you want to put, put four antennas on a 82.11n, they are just right here, three antennas. If you were to do it at, you know, one third that frequency, you will need such a big space to put antenna. Really, you have to put it on the, on the ceiling. And that's what you used to do on the roof. That's what we used to do for the TV, remember? For the TV, the antennas used to be big and they used to be on the roof. MIMO is very difficult because you can't have, you know, eight antennas. Lower frequencies have a smaller channel width because, the, so basically, you cannot get so many gigahertz. You have only four or five megahertz. You need really aggressive modulation, 256 qualm. Well, with, with 60 gigahertz, you could do with bits per second. What was that? Binary, <coughs> um, scheme. Here we can, we need 256 qualm. Doppler shift. Now, this is another thing to important. Doppler shift is VF upon C. V is the velocity. F is the frequency. C is the speed of light. Right? Doppler shift. So as the frequency goes down, the Doppler shift goes down. That means you can drive faster. Right? And therefore, it is good for mobility. You cannot really move with 60 gigahertz. All right? These are very general principles. And these are very important because these are the ones that make you really, I mean, you know, make a decision very fast, whether this scheme is good or that scheme is good. When you are sitting in a discussion, when you're sitting in a standard bodies and you have to decide whether to do this way or that way, these principles are very general. There is nothing specific about any particular thing, right? But you just have to know when to use smaller frequency, when to use larger frequency. So then there comes this TV van, 700 megahertz. We were working on 2.4 gigahertz so far, right? 2.4 and 5.9. Now we have the chance to get this TV channels, which government is allowing. So we have to look at the 700 megahertz band. Now 700 megahertz band, using the principle that we just saw, has a very long wavelength compared to 2.4 gigahertz. How long? You can divide and figure out. Right? Which one is good for long distance? 700 megahertz. So who wants it? Everybody wants it. The cell companies want it. 
of course television people have given up because they have they have better ways to better ways to do it but cell phone companies want it the the safety people want it and the general public like us and google wants it too right so everybody wants that 700 megahertz <clears throat> why because lower attenuation 17th um, to 19th of these you see that attenuation remember why it is 17th to 19th because it is square f square so the ratio if you are using 2100 megahertz cell phone right if you go at 700 megahertz one third one ninth attenuation lower transmission power lower battery life so basically if you don't want to go ninth times you know whatever more you can just reduce the power battery life goes up larger cell radius in smaller number of towers if you want if you want to put towers you don't have to put towers at this every building you know you can just put you know miles apart at 700 megahertz longer distance propagation good for rural areas and then you know you can afford to provide cellular service as well as internet service to areas which people have not provided so far all right so 700 megahertz is a very good band Particularly, if you can get for free, but people were willing to pay a lot of money for this. So, what the government did was they, they auctioned much of it for 17 to 19 billion dollars. So, they made a lot of money, and the phone companies, Verizon, AT&T, and you know, you name it, they all wanted it. Okay. but then a little bit was left and that little bit is allowed to be used for internet access for any kind of thing actually um using something principle that we'll talk about in this lecture today and that is what is called white space actually it is called tv white space because there is a lot of other white space which the government will not allow but the idea is that any spectrum which has not been allocated and why spectrum has not been allocated because generally if you give some tv station channel 2 you cannot give channel 2 to the next town why not because they will interfere with this town so channel 2 is a white space in that town second thing is if you give channel 2 to somebody you cannot give channel 3 in the same town because channel 3 might interfere with channel 2 right so there is a channel 3 white space in this town and then if you give channel 2 to somebody they don't run 24 hours a day they just run in the morning day time and then in the evening they are off the air that's a white space channel not used to avoid interference we already talked about channel 2 and 3 business and digital dividend so i will talk about that in the next slide digital dividend but anyway so the simple idea is that if you see the allocation lots of band spectrum has been allocated but not all of it is being used it is used being used at some times right whenever it is not being used or whenever it is not allocated that is all white why call why it is called white because this is how you plot when you plot you see lot of white space on the graph right so people plotted the spectrum usage and this is all spectrum and only little bit of it is blue everything else is white yeah here you can see real measurement just conducted in ottawa canada that most of the spectrum is white <coughs> all right fcc rules FCC actually has changed rules at least three to four times in the last four or five years, and so the thing is, if you are reading a paper which is four years old, it will say one thing; if you are reading which is seven years old, it will say something else. So, just like many things in this course, things are changing every year, and so I have tried to put as much current as I can find, but still there are few question marks. So they allow actually what they did was they said, okay. we will let you use it but you have to tell us when you are using it too so you have to register with them 
Now, now everybody that I'm going to register, if you just go to drive into that area with a cell phone, you're not going to register your cell phone with FCC. And therefore, they allow two kinds of devices. Fifth devices and portable or mobile devices. And um, fixed devices and portable. So let me show you what the difference is. Fixed devices must use geolocation. So they should know exactly where they are within 50 meters accuracy, which is possible with GPS. So with GPS, they can say, well, I am at this longitude and this latitude. Now they know exactly where you are, how much they have allocated to other people, and how much can you use. Right? So that's why fixed devices must use geolocation and get the channel availability daily using national databases. So the government has a database that says this has been this is being used. And um, they instead of having one database, just like DNS, instead of having just one root DNS, they have made copies. And so there are 10 companies in the United States which are allowed to have these databases. They have to synchronize among each other and they have to synchronize with the government, just like DNS is done. So this is a channel database and it is, um, you should just go to anyone. And then they allowed channel two, not allowed three and four, five to 36 and 38 to 51. Okay. And these are the only channels which are allowed so channel 3, 4, and 37, okay, so there are three channels. 3, 4 are used to communicate with other fixed or portables. They are for backhaul. 3 and 4. 37 can also be used for backhaul, but 37 more importantly is for portable microphone, so for, for wireless microphones. So basically what happens is when you go to a game, game arena, there are announcers all over the field and they have wireless microphone and you have your cell phone. If you started using the same frequency, their wireless microphone will go bad, right? So they have this channel 37 kind of available for use and they can actually use other channels as well. So they have to follow, you know, basically so this, this went on for several years. I remember in IEEE standards meeting, this wireless microphone held up the development of white space wireless for a long time. But anyway, 37 is reserved. Now they can transmit one watt and now by now you should remember how many dBs is that? How many dBm is one watt? 30. Right. So you are allowed 30 dBm with four watt EIRP. So what that means is you could concentrate it so that it becomes four watt in one direction. All right. And so 40 milliwatt on adjacent channel. Now, one thing I noticed that I read lots of FCC document. They generally keep using watts only and I, for whatever reason, I don't know. But basically, we have to translate that into dBs all the time. It's the same way, like unlicensed and licensed exempt. They kept keep using unlicensed. So, I mean, I have given up on that one. So, 40 milliwatt and adjacent channels. What that means is that if somebody is using channel 2 and you use channel 3, then you are adjacent, right? Channel. And that you cannot transmit any more than 40 milliwatt. So four, so one watt is if you are, nobody is using that channel. Sorry, four, okay. So let me just go back here to this picture. Here, there is no adjacent channel, this one. You see, notice here, this one. That one has, nobody is transmitting in that channel and in the next and the previous channel, right? There you can transmit one watt. But if you want to transmit at, um, let's say, um, this channel here, fourth slot, there you cannot transmit any more than 40 milliwatt. Outdoor antenna, 10 to 30 meter high. And if you are fixed, you need the outdoor antenna and it cannot be more than 30 meters, cannot be less than 10 meter. Periodically broadcast identification and you have, uh, sorry, go ahead. 
basically um, depending upon how high you go that far how far can you go if you are very close you cannot go very far to the ground if you are very close to the ground and so i don't know what the minimum part but the maximum is clearly so that you don't want to go you know three towns away yeah go ahead okay so the minimum is because there are devices nearby he's saying so basically that that puts the minimum and the maximum is is 30 meters and you periodically broadcast identification so you have to say who you are you know this is channel 3 you know just like radio people radio stations and, and television stations they broadcast frequently you know you are listening to 88 fm and so here you broadcast must implement power control to limit interference and so you should i mean like even though you're allowed one watt but there are situations where you may have to reduce yours and then we will talk about that in the rest of this uh, later on in this lecture so this is fixed devices right portable devices they can use only channel 26 21 to 36 and 38 to 51 and they are allowed only 50 sorry 100 milliwatt eirp and so you see this is very small power the good thing is that the portable devices don't have to register right so they they can do this little thing which will probably affect few televisions next to each if somebody is using that television that that channel but not really too far away <coughs> and 50 milliwatt eirp is using spectrum sensing only now this is the part which i am not sure about this line 50 milliwatt eirp because there have been so many modifications modifications basically this is what happens the fcc announces a rule and then the industry sues them this is united states right so basically they sued somebody you know said well no no this is not fair and this is not good and this is not you know so on and so forth and and then they change it and then somebody else you know wanted something else then they change it and they change it so this keeps going on right so i know of the third order and the fourth um, they call it fourth um, third order fourth order you see this one says second report and memorandum right there's a third report and memorandum and i don't know there's a fourth report and memorandum so somewhere um so anyway so if this in some memorandum 60 this was allowed if you are using a spectrum sensing only that means that you really don't need to do geolocation you can just sense what is being used and um, if you know that then you can go ahead and use 50, 40 milliwatt <coughs> sorry 50 milliwatt 40 milliwatt in adjacent channel so again i wanted to explain what is adjacent channel so if a station is given channel 2 they are given a service area so in this area they have exclusive control of channel 2 this is called protected contour okay and however nobody can use channel 2 in this whole area the the c area big area because if somebody used channel 2 here then the people on the edge of the p will get interrupted in, in, interfered right so this is called co channel contour so channel 2 can be given only here somewhere and actually the way it will be given is to the other people their contour should not cross you know here i mean in the sense that so they, it will be very far away it won't be just here it will be somewhere here right because they have their contour too and then this is called adjacent channel contour in this area nobody can use channel 3 that means from here to there whole whole area that includes the p as well right so there are so basically there are three areas and these areas are not circle by the way i put here as a circle but they depend upon where is the hill where is the valley where is the, you know this and that because so they just go and do the measurement and figure it out okay but just for the sake of this one we have shown here and in fact on the internet if you go you will see all these maps which show you the different stations and their reach so basically so this is a protected this is adjacent channel means next channel and this is co channel means the same channel 
Is this clear, P, A, and C? Okay. And um, so basically in adjacent channel, if you are here and you are using channel 3, then you can limit it, to, you have to limit to 40 milliwatt. Must implement power control, not required to register with FCC and obtain channel availability from fixed devices. And they do have, they don't have to go to FCC, but they have to ask somebody else. So they need a access point who can go to FCC and figure it out. Okay, so they have to obtain channel availability from fixed device is controlled by a fixed device or another portable device. So you could have a cell phone which is controlled by your laptop which is controlled by an access point. All right, so if mobile device can be controlled by another mobile device, but eventually it has to end up with FCC somehow through some fixed device. More rules. Geolocation. Access a national database to find the unused local spectrum. <coughs> Ten companies are authorized to provide that in USA. And IETF is developing a protocol how to access that database. So there are a set of messages and the fields and formats which we'll talk about actually in this lecture that IETF is working on. A spectral mask is specified. So I explained to you a spectral mask in Venice, remember? spectral mask, how you can transmit, how much you can transmit. So this is not to the scale. I just drew it just to show you. The spectral mask is really, really difficult. What they want is that you transmit whatever they are saying. Zero dB means, you know, zero dBr. Relative means this is maybe 40 milliwatt or maybe 50 milliwatt or 100 milliwatt or one watt, whatever that power is, right? Maximum. But within one channel, so you are given channel three, as soon as you get out of the channel 3, it should come down to minus 55, which is a steep drop. No other standard has done this before. Actually, this is not a standard. This is a law. So no other standard has done this before. So it is very difficult. So now people are complaining about this part. That, you know, you have to change this thing. Now, they might change it tomorrow and I wouldn't know it. But I'm just telling you that basically this is why you have to follow up with the FCC all the time. What is the latest? Because, um, uh, so anyway, so right now this is a big difference is that you really cannot use all the way up to six, six megahertz. But if you use six megahertz, you'll certainly have some overflow, which will be illegal. Okay. Now, this is United States. You go to every country, they have a different rule, whole different system, and I'm not going to talk about them. Their channel widths are different, their definition of mobile and fixed are different, their rules are very different, their power levels are very different. Particularly if you are in a, I mean like a, in a country where most of the area is rural, let's say Russia, I don't know, I'm just making it up. Um, then you really don't, you want people to reach very far, that means even higher power level than in the United States where they just limit it to 40 milliwatt. With 40 milliwatt, you cannot go very far. Right? So everything is different in every country. And um, in, in, for example, in Europe, they, they require to check every two hours. Now, in the United States, you have to register and you're good for two days. But you have to check every day. Right? But you're good for two days. In, in Europe, they, they want every two hours. All right? And they allow higher power transmission. And so basically you keep sense, I mean, they require sensing. I think the United States has gotten enough of that sensing part. I'm not sure, but that's, that's one of the differences. So this is all different in different places. Now, any question about the FCC rules? All right. So, so here is an example of if you were to use it, you could put a TV white space, TVWS, TV white space device. You could put an antenna. This is fixed. Cannot be more than 30 meters high. It would send four watts of EIRP to this house, which has an external antenna. 
So this is a flex device. You could talk to your glasses, Google glasses, 40 milliwatt, and you could talk to your phone, same thing. Um, and then this is the fixed one. Inside that, basically, you could have another TV device if you wanted to have, and, and you could have a similar kind of things. But as you can see that this can be used for two things. It can be used for what we call broadband and actually wireless access. So this is how you could get your wireless in a rural area. And this could also be used inside the home as a, as a local area network. Right? And this will be used by the phone companies, just like they use Wi-Fi today. You pay for 4G, but if you can find Wi-Fi hotspot, which is operated by the same company, say at and or Verizon or whoever you have signed up with, then that's kind of free for them and free for you. Same thing here. This is not guaranteed, but if you happen to be in an area where they have white space, they would give you, okay, like connect to white space. The current name is Wi-Fi. It's the Wi-Fi, Wi-Fi. Yeah, so this technology is not implemented yet, right? I mean, the sense that this is just FCC is making rules just like yesterday. You see, this is September 2010. There are 10 companies which can administer the, this in the United States. They get the information from FCC and they can register your device and microphones and they synchronize the database with other companies. Obviously, Microsoft and Google are one of two companies that I remember and provide channel availability list to other devices. So anybody who wants it, you can get it. I went to Google and said, okay, tell me what is available here and you can do that. So right here in this zip code 63130, this is what Google tells me. Google says that you have channel um, 2, 5, 6, 7. You can see all these kind of um, green areas. Those are available. Those are unallocated. They are available 24 hours a day. 17 channels. Actually, here is another interesting thing. I did this for channel 63131, which is my home. It's a different set of channels. Okay. So it, this could be even less than a zip code. If you, it was asking for lang latitude, longitude, but Google will take anything. Just like your, G your Google map, you can put an address, you can put a business name, you can put zip code. So I just tried this. And, and it is very specific to a location. So I didn't check whether there in our area, the wireless mics have a different channel. All right, so much about white spaces. So now we know that we have white space in St. Louis. So how do we use it? So we need the standards, we need the devices. And so obviously the standards bodies are working and working triply hard. IEEE has a wireless LAN, white space LAN, their wireless RAN, regional area network, and their wireless PAN, personal area network, and so on and so forth. IETF working is on the databases at C, which is the European people. At C is working on you know, wireless stuff. Weightless SIG is another European. SEPT is another European and ITU, which is the whole world. So everybody is working on this white space now. Of course, we will talk about only what is underlined here. Okay. And so we are very US centric in this class. And um, what we will talk about is actually in this particular lecture, we will not talk about the PAN and the RAN, which are separate lectures. So we will talk about the wireless LAN and everything else here. Okay, the wireless LAN, Wi-Fi, 
And this year, the standard is in 2014. The standard is not out yet. It is supposed to come out in March 2014, which is next week. So <laughs> hopefully it will come out. I don't know. So we are just studying it just before it comes out. So actually, the FCC called this thing super Wi-Fi. And then, you know, who complained? Wi-Fi Alliance said, this is our trademark. You cannot use it. So then it has been now called SuperFi. <laughs> okay, draft approved by working group and A22 executive committee, final appro uh, approval. Appro uh, so basically it is there. I mean, in the sense that the draft is there. And um, and people are making devices. It's just that it has to go through some signatures, which takes time. Why displays wireless using cognitive radios up to five kilometers? So here is the definition of the LAN, five kilometers, which is kind of long. But this 700 megahertz is good, right? So that's what it can do it. Since the bit is very small, they have to use 256 QAM, five, six, and three microsecond guard interval similar to what we did in 802.11n, and we can get up to 26 megabits for 6 megahertz channel, right? And then up to four channels may be wanted together in one or two contiguous blocks, and then um, MIMO can be used for four parallel streams using STBC. So you get Four streams times four channels times 26, you will get 16 times. Somehow you should get that number. 426 megabits. Not bad compared to 11G, for example, which was only 54 megabits. And so the main thing is, and this is going this far, there will be a lot more devices it will be covering as 11G, which goes only, you know, very small distances. So the phi is very similar to everything else we have seen so far in 11. This is 11, the same people. So we have 6 megahertz, and you can do channel bonding. So you can make W plus W. What that means is you take one channel here and one channel there, W plus W. Or you can take two W, which means channel 2 and 3 together, something like that. So contiguous. Or you can have 2W plus 2W or 4W. So maximum you can get is 4W by either method, by the 2W, 2W or 4W. And then you can do MIMO on the top of that with 4x space-time block coding. Now, if you remember space-time block coding, STBC, we talked about where there's a space, two antennas is a space and time. In the first slot, you transmit something. In the second slot, you transmit the related symbols and so on and so forth. So here, there are four antennas and four time slots, four by four. That is called 4x space-time block coding. Uh, and you can do multi-user MIMO. Now, I don't know how many of you remember multi-user MIMO, but basically with a single user MIMO, you just have, everybody has to have four antennas, right? I mean, then you will get effect. But if somebody has only one, then you can take four users and make a MIMO. Right? That was multi-user MIMO. OFDM is very similar to 40 megahertz in 802.11n. Now, this is another interesting thing is that now this is the squeezed 40 megahertz into 6 megahertz right here. So you have 144 carriers in 6 megahertz. Out of that, 108 are data. 3 DC. DC is the basically central frequencies. And then 6 pilots, some blue frequencies here. And 36 guards on the ends. That makes up for 144 carriers. in 6 megahertz. So this is OFDM, very similar to 11N and A and all that, except that this is a little bit squeezed in the sense that 
remember, um, they had in 20 megahertz, they had 50, 64 carriers total in A, G, and N. 64 carriers. Now we are squeezing 144 in 6 megahertz. So the carriers are very close to each other. And that means, what does it mean in terms of speed? Anybody can guess? Does it do any effect? You cannot drive very fast. Because if the carriers are very close to each other, the Doppler shift will cause intercarrier interference. Right? So this is actually not designed for you know cars or anything. Even actually in the car, if you remember in the vehicular networking, we discussed this issue that they did the same thing in vehicular networking. Maybe they found out that maybe 64 is too few carriers. So they tried to squeeze in 10 megahertz, you know, the same 64 carriers. Now here in 5 megahertz, there is uh, actually 6 megahertz, they're squeezing more than 64. <coughs> All right, so the speed may be the concern. All right, so so much about the phi. Um, then they have a special protocol to just worry about the databases. So geolocation database is called GDB. And you can keep a cache yourself. And that is called RLSS, Registered Location Secure Server. This is your own database, your own copy of the database. So, for example, a big company like AT&T will have RLSS, Verizon may have, and Washu may have. So, they, so that is your server, and that way you don't have to go to GDB every for every single thing. So RLSS is a registered location secure server, provides faster response to access points locally in a campus, maybe ISP owned. And so this RLSS could be AT&T, you know, or somebody else, okay. Geolocation database dependent entities. So geo, GDD enabling and GDD dependent. So GDD enabling are these access points. These access points are GDD enabling because they can go to the GDB. Right, but these devices are GDD dependent because they don't go to the database, they just go to access point. All right, now, so there are two protocols. One is to what you do inside your own network. This has been standardized by IEEE and there is called RLQP. Okay, registered location query protocol. RLQP is what you talk to your access point or you talk to your RLSS. And then there is another protocol which is general enough to talk to the databases and that is called PAS. That is by IETF. Now why two different protocols? Because this is very specific to 11 AF. This is not a specific to. There might be other devices which are speaking 802.22 or 802.15, which need to go to the databases. So that pause is independent of 11F. It has nothing with 11F. It is just general for all technologies that want to use white spaces. Whereas this RLQP has been designed by 11F. So obviously it cannot, it, it does not need to be followed by 22 or, you know, or um, 15 or something like that. But this is, has to be used by all 11 devices. RLQP to talk to your database provider. Basically to, the devices will talk to access point to find out what channel to use. And the access point will talk to the RLSS to find out what channels to use. All right, so one 
thing is this whole thing about GDD enabling and GDD dependent. It's just a twist of tongue. So basically remember this one. Enabling is the one that can give you the database and dependent are the one that want to get the database, right? So they can't really give you anything. So, <clears throat> so here is a sample of the messages. So now the, the whole thing is if you have ever designed this thing, you will go to the standard and figure out all the messages and the fields and so on and so forth. We are not going to go to that detail here. But I just put some sample messages so that you know what kind of things that are standardizing. So there is an RLSS, there is an access point registration. The access point first goes to the RLSS and says, what can I use? CSM request. The next slide actually has all the details. You can read that. So, um, Channel schedule management, what channels can I use, right? And it gets the response and then it sends out a beacon. Says, okay, I am the access point and I am available on channel two. And channel seven, maybe, whatever, right? So this person says, okay, I like to connect to you. So then contact verification signal. So it says, Tell me who you are, what's your social security number and so on and so forth. Everything, basically password and things like that. And then, so you give that. In fact, you also give your location. And then, channel um, NCC request can be sent and NCC request will be, is the sent by the stations to access point requesting the use of a channel. This is basically, the station could say, can I use channel eight, please? No, and then it will come back. Okay. And disassociate. So basically, guys, there's associate, there's a disassociate. Let's see, I think we have covered everything. CSM is a request. Uh, AP can ask other AP RLSS about white space map. The AP broadcast the beacon on all channels selected. So if they have four channels, they will broadcast on all four channels, depending on what the stations are listening to. The stations will associate with the access point. Contact verification signal, the APs tell their stations white source map and confirm that these stations are still associated. And um, Contact availability query stations ask access point if they do not receive the map within time or interval. So this I didn't tell you. Basically, so the stations should make sure that the channel two is still available. Now they are listening on channel two. Suddenly the access point is gone to channel five, right? So they should get off channel two as soon as possible. Coming to you. So this is FCC requirement is that basically you have to verify that you're still connected to somebody who is connected to FCC, right? If you're not connected to FCC, then you get off the channel. Right, so this is contact availability query. So basically every so often the stations will listen to the access point beacon or whatever and they say, okay, I'm in, I'm in touch, I'm in touch. If they don't hear it, then they have to send a query. And then the query response comes back. Fine. If it doesn't come back, then they get out. Yeah. Next question now. Um, this is just to give you an idea that there is a RLQ protocol which allows you to continue to use that. Now, NCC request sent by station requesting use of a particular channel. Now, if the access point doesn't know that you can use channel 8, they will send it to RLSS. Can I use channel 8 and then get back to you? That is the response. And so that's, that's the RLQP. All right. Um, so this is all about 11F, 11AF is done, right? Now the problem is 
there are several issues. So as we talked about, there are so many standards from IEEE 802.22 and 15 and 11 and so on and so forth. So the next set of standards we talk about is related to how to live with others. So first problem is coexistence. Why coexistence? Because both 22, which is a regional area network and going to cover a big town and has a higher power. So this is four watt EIRT. And um, so this is going to, and then you have a little LAN here, which is 11 AF and you are limited to 100 milliwatt, something like that. How can you live together? Right? There are two issues. One is called exposed terminal. Exposed terminal means that basically they are making so much noise that you cannot really do any useful transmission. So it is just very noisy. And hidden terminal is that you might do something that they may not realize. I mean, basically, um, they, you can send a signal which will affect this AP, but not affect other people. Or this may affect this station, but not affect other. So people will not know that, you know, there is a, there is a collision. So there is a carrier um, collision. Yeah. So these are two things, right? I mean, when two stage, two networks, two different networks use the same, um, frequency. For that, I triple set up another committee. Actually, this committee has been around forever, 802.19. 802.19 job is to solve the coexistence problem. It started right when 11 and 15 started. 11 was Wi-Fi and 15 started with Bluetooth and both of them use 2.4 gigahertz. If and, and most devices have both. So you have Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, both of them use 2.4 gigahertz, how do they ever get uh, anything through, right? So, so they have, they, they are called RAT independent. RAT is radio access technology. So there are two words they use, radio access technology, RAT, and R-A-N, radio access network, RAN. So radio access technology independent, that means it will work for any of these technologies. But 19.1 is a subset of 19, a subgroup of 19 that is working especially on the white spaces. It is not out yet. I have draft five, which is dated February, which is this month. Final is expected in September. So I am on basically review committee on many of these. Um, so I get drafts as they come out. Um, but basically, so I have February 2014. So what does it say? What it says is that you have to have these functions. There has to be something called coexistence discovery and information server, CDIS. Again, this slide and the next slide are related. There has to be a coexistence manager. There has to be a coexistence enabler and there have to be lots of wide space objects. So these are devices. Obviously there's a database. There may be a lot of managers, depending upon how many networks you have. And then there are protocols between them, A, B1, B2, B3, these are all the protocols that they have to standardize in 19.1. So how does the manager talk to other manager and says, look, I am also using, can you use something different? I'm using channel two, can you use channel three? Can we use channel two? Half? half and half, things like that. So I will go through this next time. I will stop right here.